Welcome all to Andy and John Talk Telecom. We are happy that you are here. Uh, before we get started, John, will you give our listeners a preview of what is to come in this episode? Absolutely, Andy. Today we're going to talk about Verizon's 4G and 5G definitions, government tinkering with the internet, FCC's F uh, auction bonanza continues, and we're going to talk about upstream upgrades. Sounds good. You ready to get into it? Let's do it. Let's go. You've got mail. This is Andy and John Talk Telecom with Andy Netzel and John Rewe. You're now logged into Andy and John Talk Telecom. I am Andy Netzel. I'm John Rewe. And John, how are you doing this fine Sunday morning? Oh, just doing peachy. It's a lovely day in Austin, Texas. How are you? Good. I'm I'm, I'm doing I'm doing good as well. It's a little little rainy, a little drizzly here, but um, you know, spring is here. Uh, so it seems like and here to stay. So just doing some yard work and all those things that um you need to do around the house, uh, and outside. Uh, that you're waiting for nice warm weather for so uh, that that yeah, weather it's... seems to be here so try to knock all that stuff out yeah nice to put that ice storm and the snow apocalypse uh what does somebody call it <laughs> uh it's, it called some sort of covid thing like it's just that thing is all in the past and now we can focus on spring and new beginnings that's right that's right let's put <clears throat> let's put all that cold behind us hopefully uh never see that again down here in texas and uh, and just move on just move on but hey, John, we've talked uh, about 5G again and again, uh, as well as the Internet of Things. Um, do you remember what some of those future possibilities for the Internet of Things uh, were? Yeah, I think we talked about autonomous vehicles, um, digital, digitization or automiza- uh, automation of industrial uh, factories, uh, connected home appliances, you know, talking about your... Uh, you know, refrigerators that reorder stuff from Amazon Prime whenever you get low on milk or whatever. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, haptic gloves for remote surgeries. And then we've talked about, you know, all the smart city or we've kind of touched on smart city uh, use cases. Yeah. Y- yeah. We talked about all those things. But what if I told you the Internet of Things would also include space, the next what? frontier, the last frontier, you know, whatever, whatever people we yeah, know, whatever people want to call space. So the Air Force they are interested in looking at um, 5G capabilities for space-based communications. Last year, uh, AT- on the terrestrial side, last year AT&T brought 5G to three Air Force bases in uh, Colorado, Alaska, and Nebraska. Um, but you know, the Air Force must have liked what they saw as they're now looking to bring 5G to space, specifically the CBRS band. Uh, the Air Force hmm. issued an RFI, a request for information, that read in part, and I quote, any aspect of 5G applied to any aspect of space systems is of potential interest, end quote. But further specifies it is most interested in MIMO, multiple input, multiple output, uh, MEC, multi-axis edge computing, which I think we have talked about a little bit before, uh, cybersecurity, yeah. RAND slicing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and deep learning. Uh, so really, it just seems like, and an, an, an from their statement, an all-encompassing, like, hey, if you have, uh, you know, some sort of plans or some sort of interest in, in 5G and in space, we are open for business and we're willing to listen. So so come and pitch it to us. So it seems like the, uh, the future is now, John. Well, it sounds like it is. I think one of the parts of this that I find interesting, or I guess I don't fully understand is you know, 5G in space, what are the, you know, we know about the propagation of 5G signals in the U.S. And of course, we've talked a lot about mid band, high band, low band, and how each has its own, you know, sort of uh, place in, uh, in our terrestrial applications. Um, How are those going to work in space? You know, how does they, how do signals propagate in space? Do they propagate well? Do they not propagate well the space dust mess things up you know that'll be interesting to see as these discussions unfold you know <clears throat> what does 5g look like in space 
Yeah, I, I don't know. And I, it seems like the Air Force doesn't know either, and that's why they're uh, putting this, <laughs> this RFI there and, and looking for all the smart <sighs> brains to get together and, and figure something out. But, hey, maybe uh, ultra-wideband or millimeter wave, um, you know, very low, very small um, range, you know, terrestrially, hey, maybe it will have a, a far-reaching range in space. But that's for, uh, <laughs> that's not for us to figure out. Someone will figure that out and, and go from there. Fascinating. Space All right. Is the, space is, uh, I guess, more uh, relevant to us today than than I guess back when I was a kid and we were still shooting off space shuttles. <laughs> more relevant than ever before. So, want to get into the news? Let's do it. Let's do it. John, I spoke with a friend last week who was uh, very confused about the differences in 4G and 5G um, and became even more confused after uh, hearing you and I speak about CBRS and C-band and the different auctions um, and you know how that could bolster both 4G and 5G offerings. So that got me to thinking um, maybe we should break down the different 4G and 5G types. Uh, and I chose Verizon as an example. I was able to find, as I was able to find a bunch of information in regards to their networks. Uh, so we're going to discuss CBRS, uh, 4G, millimeter wave 5G, and DSS, dynamic spectrum sharing 5G. Uh, but I will start wow. really, really, really basic here. So it's an alphanumeric soup there. Alphanumeric soup. That's right. So I mean, it's it's hard to keep everything, um, uh, you know, keep everything organized uh, with all the different offerings that there are and people are coming out with new technology. Uh, so let's start really basic and, and talk about spectrum. There's low band spectrum, mid band spectrum, and high band spectrum. So each has its own advantages and disadvantages. Low band spectrum, uh, you can travel great distances, but speeds are, are you know comparatively slow. High band can provide blazing fast speeds, but distance is limited. And it's also more affected by obstacles and and things in its path. Um, Mid-band spectrum is a, is, a, is a good mix of both low and high bands. Um, and it'll, some of that um, mid-band spectrum that's uh, on the higher side, closer to high band spectrum is, is very coveted. And it was auctioned off by the FCC recently in the CBRS and the C-band auctions. Um, so what's the difference between CBRS and C-band frequencies? Uh, both are in the mid-band spectrum range and uh, edge higher or closer to high band uh, than low band, but they are in the mid band spectrum. CBRS is in the 3.55 to 3.7 gigahertz range, while C band is right above that at 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz. Uh, so Verizon currently uh, is running some 4G LTE on CBRS, and that again, that's mid band spectrum. Their CBRS network is uh, currently limited to you know, only certain areas of the country, but continues to expand um, at, as it is close, as you know, I, I just stated, to the C-band spectrum uh, that Verizon bid a whole bunch of uh, you know, billions of dollars on and plans to roll out uh, over the next few years. Uh, John, are you interested in the actual data of the speed tests? Of course. What, uh, how does it break down? So uh, it breaks down a little bit like this. Uh, CBRS 4G was clocked at up to 815 megabits per second, according to PC Mag. Uh, those are some some great speeds, uh, in, in my opinion. I mean, if, yeah, it's I mean, almost a gig there. You, I mean, you can't really go wrong impressive. with that on your cellular network. Exactly. Very impressive. Um, and as Verizon rolls out their C-band spectrum following the auction, those speeds can go even higher or at least be you know even more consistent. Um, at, at you know 815 megabits sure. per second ish uh, so for those who don't have a, a 5g capable phone yet you know no worries that you know, apple just started selling a 5g capable iphone um and you know not everybody wants to change out their iphone every year so you know if you don't have that 5g capable phone yet you know don't don't maybe don't worry about it yet your 4g lte speeds should continue to increase as Verizon upgrades its networks um with cbrs uh, frequencies or C-band frequencies. Uh, so you should continue to speed, see some very fast 4G LTE speed. So no need to go out and, and buy a new phone just yet if you don't want to. On the 5G side, uh, Verizon employs 
a dynamic spectrum sharing DSS 5G in certain parts of the country. In PCMag speed tests, the DSS 5G network topped out at 358 megabits per second. So yeah, it's slower than the CBRS 4G hmm. LTE, but those are still some pretty good speeds. Um, sure. You know, and if you think about a you know short, I don't know, five years ago, weren't we still on 3G and you know not even touching those kind of speeds? Um, so yeah, and, and that's not even the best 5G network that Verizon has to offer, and the one that and, and not the one they want to offer. Uh, and what would that best network that Verizon offers is? That network would be the millimeter wave ultra wideband 5G, which Verizon continues to uh, push into more areas of the country. Verizon is that important- ultra wideband, right? Ultra wideband, that's right. Ultra, yeah. ultra wideband. So Verizon is employing millimeter wave 5G technology in, in major metro, major metropolitan areas. Think Houston, Dallas, New York, LA, um, but even you know mid-sized cities. Mid-sized cities are are starting to see um, this millimeter wave 5G technology from uh, Verizon. So millimeter wave 5G utilizes high band spectrum. Remember, high band can deliver blazing fast speeds but is limited on distance and is more uh, affected by obstacles in its path. Mm-hmm. So millimeter wave 5G utilizes this high band spectrum. Um, and it, it does, it does deliver those super fast speeds. Uh, but again, does not have the distance that mid band spectrum can provide. But the speeds, John, the speeds are dynamite. Um, you know, those speeds should blow both oh, DSS yeah. 5G and CBRS or C band 4G out of the water. Yeah, it's going to be multi gigabit speeds, right? And that's just going to be a game changer. I mean, even right now, not many uh, things that we do on our phones are even going to be able to, you know, you're not even going to be able to appreciate what 800 plus megabits per second on your CBRS 4G can do. And just to think, we're going to be going multiples of that kind of speed with, uh, you know, with the ultra wideband 5G. Um, It's going to be some incredible stuff. Uh, that you can do with that. And so what's what's Verizon's plan? You know, say like me, I live in Houston, right? And I have a 5G capable phone. I can, you know, be rolling around in Houston getting, using the millimeter wave 5G technology, getting super fast, super high speeds. And for whatever reason, if I'm, you know, blocked by a building or, you know, I go outside the city of Houston where the millimeter wave technology, you know, hasn't spread out to yet, then I can switch over to this, um, you know, C-band network that's you know still delivering close to gigabit speeds and like you said john i'm not using you know programs or i don't need those super fast speeds so i'm probably not even going to see any sort of degradation of of you know speed while i'm just using my phone to you know scroll twitter or send emails or make phone calls sure i you're probably not even going to notice it and you know the crazy thing is is you look at how many different things are deployed right now you've got uh, your regular LTE 4G, and then you've got a 4G running on uh, on the CBRS spectrum. You've got different forms of 5G out there. You've got dynamic spectrum sharing in some places. So there's a lot of different uh, formats and technologies within that are that are being deployed uh, concurrently right now. So there's a lot of different ways for us to for them to uh, make our phones a lot faster. And I just read something this morning about how uh, uh, Samsung in their laboratories had pioneered or sort of uh, proven that they could aggregate a 4g and a 5g um streams concurrently and just basically aggregate the two so whatever the best of both combined together um and got like three point something gigabit per second so really it's you know they probably can are going to be to a point where whether you're like you said you're you've got ultra wideband here and you're starting to lose some signal but we're also able to pick up some 4g uh just aggregate all that together and you're going to get your best uh, uh, cumulative effort from the two. Um, it's going to be pretty amazing what's going to be able to be accomplished with this. It is. It is. It's, it's going to be great. If you want, um, you know, some more Verizon, John, Verizon's 5G home internet service is ar- arriving in 10 new cities. Starting uh, last week, Americans in Cleveland, Vegas, Louisville, Omaha, San Diego, Charlotte, Cincinnati, Hartford, Kansas City, and Salt Lake City uh, will see service rolled out into their neighborhoods. And uh, what what speeds is Verizon promising between 300 megabits per second and up to one gigabit per second of download speed with no data caps? All for fifty dollars if you're a current Verizon customer, or seventy dollars if you're not. So Verizon um, expanding all over the place, both their cellular network, uh, um, you know, for for P 
people using their cell phones and, you know, continuing to expand their, you know, app to the home internet experience, uh, you know, their 5G home internet, um, just rolling out new cities all the time. Well, that's fascinating. And looking at that $50 price point for a current customer, um, that's really right in line with the entry level um, spectrum uh, DOCSIS uh, broadband offering here in Austin for uh, $49.99, uh, which gives you 300 megs. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if the performance is going to, how that's going to compare or the reliability, but uh, certainly in an already competitive marketplace, that's uh, yet another player there. And it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, uh, those networks are not used to the capacity of, of what uh, home broadband uh, demand is versus mobile demand as far as data. But um, we'll see if those networks can hold up and mount a challenge to the uh, fixed uh, broadband pro- providers. Absolutely. If you're, a, if you're a Verizon customer, sounds like a good deal to me. So, John, we just talked about um, some, some spectrum basics, low band, mid band, high band spectrum. Uh, and you found some information about the FCC doing a, another auction um, with some more mid-band spec, more mid-band spectrum. Indeed, Andy. So uh, I guess uh, we could say that the FCC auction bonanza continues. We've talked about FCC auctions a lot on the podcast over the past few months, and uh, specifically in this very high-value mid-band spectrum uh, that is critical for the deployment of the 5G networks in America. So you know, while we're the industry is still processing through the implications of the recent C-band auction. Um, the FCC is preparing to offer up even more spectrum to the highest bidders as they scramble to facilitate the American wireless industry's efforts to catch up in the global 5G race. Um, you know, we talked a lot about the C-band auction. That was uh, technically called the Auction 107. Um, and the staggering $45 billion and $23 billion uh, spins by Verizon and AT&T, respectively, in that auction. So much and, so much money, and that's actually just the spectrum. That doesn't actually include the additional costs of spectrum uh, clearing uh, that has to go with that. So, um, like for Verizon, the, it's really the equivalent of fifty-three uh, billion that they're looking Ooh. at. And I can't remember if Verizon's was uh, or uh, AT and T's was more. So, yeah, it's a huge chunk. Um, but these expenditures pave the way for those two companies to edge closer to T-Mobile's impressive trove of mid-band spectrum assets, um, and they still have the lead even after the C-band auction. Uh, but given the expectations we have for 5G generally in the U.S., the cumulative mid-band holdings of the big three, Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile, may not be enough. So, auction 107, the C-band auction made available 280 megahertz of radio frequencies, and the, uh, as you mentioned in your uh, story earlier, the 3.7 to 3.98 gigahertz band. Um, the CBRS auction was for... Uh, 3.55 uh, to 3. Point, uh, whatever gigahertz Seven. band 3.7 yeah so we've kind of we're kind of working back from from um 3.98 working back downward and auction 110 is on deck now auction 110 is set to put 100 additional megahertz of mid-band spectrum um 3.4 to 3.55 so I mean, now we're going to have uh, a bigger chunk to play with in the mid man. And yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty crazy. I mean, we just keep um, keep offering up all these this spectrum. And I think a lot of observers are saying, you know, it's better late than never. But um, yeah. I mean, we need this to, to build out and, and achieve what we need to. So acting FCC chair, Jessica Rosenworcel, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her last name. We, uh, we talk about her from time to time. Um, and I think we've observed as well that she's uh, seems to be pretty aggressive with uh, expanding uh, the definitions of broadband in America and uh, pushing us forward in uh, higher speeds, higher benchmarks. In, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, generally I'm I'm appreciative of the of the sense of urgency she's kind of set forth there. Uh, generally, uh, but she said that most of the country has yet to experience the benefits of a true five G network. The out there innovations it can deliver are still a ways off because so many of them are not about connectivity delivered via phones. Plus, for so many consumers, the present is confusing with carriers providing different versions of 5G, which can sometimes feel like a lot like the 4G they already have, as you kind of discussed earlier. And in part, this is due to the fact that carriers don't always have the airwaves that they need to provide consistent and widespread coverage at this time. So today we take action to change this, as I continue to quote the FCC uh, acting chair. 
We take action that will move us closer to 5G service that is fast, secure, resilient, and most importantly, available everywhere in the country. We will accomplish this by adopting rules and auction procedures that will make available 100 megahertz of prime mid-band spectrum in 3.45 to 3.55 gigahertz band. This offers real opportunity because during the past few years, the United States was slow relative to other countries to recognize the importance of mid-band for 5G. And this meant we were late to bringing these airwaves to market. So mid-band spectrum has been critical component, is the critical component that's been missing in our action here helps fix that. She went on to say that the urgency of catching up with the world in 5G will be written into the auction 110 rules, saying that they will include the most aggressive build-out obligations of any spectrum auction wow. for 5G to date. So what does that mean? Obligations of auction 110 winners will be to deploy the spectrum for use in half the time required under previous auctions. So, you know, if, up in the ante. Yeah, um, you got to accelerate these deployments as if they don't have enough projects already. So <laughs> they didn't just spend uh, billions on <laughs> on other auctions that they're still rolling out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, well, I mean, we were going to dump all this money into these the spectrum that we need, but uh you know, we also have to spend all this money to actually make it available to the yeah. consumers and deploy that. And uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the vendors are going to have to supply. And it's a whole supply chain building up to that. So it'll be really interesting to see if this really does serve to accelerate our deployment efforts and, and get this 5G uh, nationwide network, um, you know, uh, available to more people quicker. Another key objective of the auction is to encourage smaller companies to bid. According to Rosenworcel, more than 90% of the licenses that were available in the uh, in the uh, last auction were won by the top two bidders, obviously Verizon and AT&T. Mm -hmm. Organ organizations representing potential small bidders, however, say that the new structure, uh, bidding structure in auction, in this new auction is not going to achieve that goal. The Rural Wireless Association, for one, complained that like the recently concluded C-band auction, this auction will be dominated by Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT&T. Large license areas coupled with build-out requirements based on population and not geography is a formula for stranding rural areas without broadband access because the big three carriers will focus, as they always have, on highly populated urban network build-outs. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see how that discussion plays out and if they do kind of restructure uh, the auction under pressure from these kind of groups to uh, kind of favor uh, a more diverse uh, bidder pool. I mean, they might, but have have you and I not talked about billions and billions going into, um, you know, rural communities to connect rural communities? So, I mean, maybe this auction does not specify, um, you know, particularly it needs to go to rural communities and, you know, smaller um, providers may miss out. But, you know, there's there are tons of other government money out there that's going specifically towards rural communities. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if FCC changes their you know, their, their parameters for this based on pressure, like you said. Indeed. You know, and it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of money here. And then, uh, you know, also on the table separately is the um, big infrastructure bill in Congress right now that, um, yeah. you know, is talking about a hundred billion dollars for, um, you know, inf uh, broadband infrastructure in the U S and, and build outs. Uh, that's of course on top of the art off money. So how does this play in and factor in to helping us deploy all this? I don't know. Timelines will be interesting. Uh, the auction, this auction is set for October. Um, and with previous auctions, of course, we'll be watching these developments here with great interest. And as if this wasn't exciting enough, another there's auction, more. wait, there's more call now. And um, get, get another, <laughs> Get another piece of spectrum. The FCC has also put forth proposed bidding procedures for yet another chunk of spectrum in what would be auction 108. So I guess we're going from auction 107, 110s for real, but there's also maybe going to be auction 108. So okay. we may have yet another auction on the docket this year, so stay tuned. I will, John. I will stay tuned, and I can't wait for you to tell me more about auction 110 as we get closer and 108 if it actually happens. You know, I think it'd be a lot more fun instead of this uh, bidding process process that they've had. If we could kind of do it like a cattle auction or a, a machinery auction, where you have one of those cool cowboy auctioneers up there saying, "Yeah, like the Grand County bid, auction." Having a bid, yeah, exactly. Hey, pretty <laughs> going just about a mile. That's right. So yeah, going about a mile a minute. Yep. But uh, like it. anyways, yep, yeah, good times.
All right, John, we just, uh, you mentioned a little while ago, you know, when's the first time a cellular company and a uh, traditional cable company are going to merge. You wanted to talk a little bit about cable companies and what they are doing to their networks. Absolutely. So, you know, on this podcast, we talk about all forms of internet and telecom. Uh, we talk about wireless, satellite, fiber. Um, if you're listening to this in your home, though, it's most likely that you are listening to it uh, with an inter -connection, internet connection provided by a cable company, unless you have the Verizon Home 5G. Uh, but while wireless companies are dumping billions of dollars into upgrading their networks to 5G, Elon Musk is spending bajillions of dollars on rockets. Jillions. Yeah, or any other kind of uh, alien that sounds cool. Um, cable companies, meanwhile, are pouring research resources into upgrading their networks to support the spike in COVID spurred work from home and other trends, which is occurring on top of the projected uh, normal growth. Um, so kind of looking at history, cable companies are pretty unique in the sense that they can give you multi-gig internet service over the same coax cable that they used to deliver like three or four cable channels back in the 70s. You know, cable TV started with a guy that couldn't get, they couldn't get any, um, like regular off the air, uh, you know, CBS, ABC in their town because they were like down in a valley or something. So they put a tower up on a hill so he could receive those channels. And then he ran coax down the tower, down the hill into the town and started wiring up cities. Later on, they added satellites on top of the towers or down there. And, and that's kind of how cable TV was born. So, but basically the core technology of cable TV is RF signals sent over coax cable. New modulation schemes, virtualization and automation have been unlocking more and more potential from RF over the years and will continue to do so for a while. It's a weird world where you, you have an active and passive devices in this in the that still vaguely resemble their 1970s forebears in the same ecosystem as state of the art virtual virtualized monitoring and troubleshooting tools. Um, if you look at a cable TV uh, node or amplifier, you're like you open it up. I mean, it looks like modern stuff in there and stuff that looks like it's from the from the 50s sometimes. Um, it's a but it doesn't it is but it does some amazing things you know when i say it's the same piece of coax from the 70s that's a bit of a stretch today's coax cable is light years ahead uh in quality and shielding but it's still coax and rf is still rf the difference is what we do with it uh cable tv plants today usually use an rf spectrum uh between 5 and 1000 megahertz um the majority of that is for downstream communications uh video service and doxis downstream service um, as we look to um, provide even faster internet and uh, more DOCSIS channels are looking at pushing from 1,000 up to 1.2 or 1.5 uh, megahertz. But this, uh, the smaller portion of this uh, 5 to 1,000 megahertz spectrum has been used for uh, upstream communications, uh, <clears throat> primarily upstream DOCSIS channels um, and formerly like set-top box communications. I, they still use a little piece of it for that. Um, historically, there's been a lot less data going upstream compared to downstream. It was basically like when you send an email or if you're on a voice over IP uh, phone call, like your voice traveling back to the other person is in the upstream. Um, or if you're on a video chat, um, you know, the video audio is going back out that way. And then there came gaming and that uh, the that requires real-time communication, two-way communication, and that is a lot of data now and is only growing at a really high rate. So that's the stuff that's going upstream. And before COVID, the demand for that uh, upstream bandwidth was growing to a point where cable companies were looking at various strategies to expand upstream speed and capacity. But since COVID hit, the upstream demand has gone way up, uh, forcing cable companies to act faster. One of the ways they're doing this is with node splits. So in a typical HFC plant, fiber goes to each node and then the node feeds, uh, let's just say a thousand homes uh, over coax, basically. Um, with so many people on at home, on Zoom and team calls, um, gaming, whatever, people are doing everything at home that they used to do at office. So now they're using that home internet connection uh, like crazy. And so there's a lot more upstream data and the nodes are getting maxed out. So 
what a lot of cable companies are doing now um, are node splits. It's the quickest way to to fix this problem of utilization. So now what they'll go is they'll either flip a switch or plug something into a node or add an additional like physical node next to, uh, somewhere else in the plant and split that. So if one node was feeding 1,000 homes, now we're feeding 500 homes. So they bring down the utilization to an acceptable level so people can still get the kind of service they need. But, you know, that's just kind of a ongoing thing. You just split and split and split. And, and it's not a forever... I was saying that's just like yeah. um, we talked about small cells earlier. You know, the more small cells you put in the area, the more capacity you have. Um, you know, you're talking about splitting the the load between various nodes. It's just the same mm -hmm. basic concept. Yeah, because um, and as demand goes up, uh, each each node cannot handle as much as it once did. So sure. this is not really a this is really not a forever fix um, because usage per household just keeps going up. I mean. Uh, one of the biggest utilization issues, uh, especially since COVID arrived, is really just this upstream utilization. Downstream demand is up too, but uh, upstream is so much more important now. So you remember I said that cable plants use most of their five to 1,000 megahertz spectrum for downstream. Well, for years, the zone between five and 42 megahertz uh, has been reserved for upstream traffic. Um, for years now, we've been talking about taking a bigger chunk of the spectrum for return um, that's called like a mid split or a high split. So mid splits will take the return from five to 42 megahertz. We'll push that out to 85 megahertz. So now you've got a bigger uh, chunk of bandwidth to use for upstream. A high split will push that up to like, I think you say 204 megahertz or 205. We've been talking about this for years in the cable industry. Um, and and uh, the equipment for doing it has been developed. Uh, there's a lot of marketing around it. Um, but... Uh, you know, they haven't really done a ton of deployment, at least from what I can tell. Um, there's some new research out that sort of suggests things are picking up, though, uh, as of last year. Cable operator spending on upstream channel purchases climbed 96% in Q4 of 2020 compared to 2019, according to fresh data from Jeff Hainan, VP of Broadband Access and Home Networking at Del Oro Group, which does research on these things. If you look closer at the report, you'll see that James seems to validate what I have suspected, that this seeming big jump in spending on upstream upgrades is partly just because so little has been spent so far. Again, it's been a lot of talk, not so much action. Uh, now that operators really don't have a choice, it seems the trend will likely continue. Um, you know, one of the things that makes these mid splits and high splits even more effective, though, is when you combine that with deployment of OFDMA modulation. So part of uh, part of how this DOCSIS works is the way we send these signals and the way these signals are constructed. So um, DOCSIS 3.1 is just so much more efficient and it uses OFDM uh, on the downstream. Uh, but most operators are, have made that jump from DOCSIS 3.0, but they're still using DOCSIS 3.0 modulation schemes in their upstream. Um, so if you take your upstream and move that over to DOCSIS 3.1 uh, OFDMA in the upstream, you can gain the efficiencies of that while also making better use of the five to 15 megahertz space. So the lower end of that return spectrum has always been a problem area because there's so much more noise and issues down there. And uh, single channel DOCSIS uh, channels have a struggle with those, with those issues there. Um, one of the beautiful things about OFDM and OFDMA, which is part of DOCSIS 3.1, is that it carries, uh, kind of to simplify, it says it carries duplicate pieces of data on different subchannels. So if one channel subchannel gets disrupted by noise or something, once that data, those pieces of data get to the end point, they can still be reassembled uh, correctly and corrected better because um, if you lost one channel in a single channel qualm, you just lost all that data where it's kind of split up more. So it's more uh, agile and it's and it can handle disruptions. Uh, it's much more robust. So you can get more out of that work, uh, five to 15 megahertz part of the spectrum uh, with OFDMA modulation than you could with the old form. So by so by doing that, by combining uh, move to OFDMA and doing a mid split, you're going to get way more upstream. So you could actually conceivably get uh, gigabit upstreams and multi-gigabit downstream and be able to handle so much more uh, than what we're doing today. Um, and it looks like we're finally finally headed that direction. 
Um, looking ahead, uh, Del Oro's five-year forecast shows that the focus on upstream will be a growing trend, kind of what the next steps of evolution will look like for cable companies. Uh, these are their data. They're uh, quoting their uh, uh, points here. Quickly improving upstream capacity through mid, split, and high split upgrades, resulting in positive year-over-year -year increases in upstream channel license purchases through 2025. So that's kind of one of the ways they're tracking uh, expenditures is um, you have to buy licenses for your channels, basically, mm -hmm. um, from the vendor that makes the makes your equipment. So um, if you're having to launch more upstream channels, you're buying more licenses. So that's kind of what they're one of the ways they're tracking the the spend on upstream. Uh, another thing is uh, look for a trend in replacing legacy optical nodes that have reached maximum segmentation. Um, and putting instead uh, distributed access architecture nodes, DAA nodes. Uh, those DAA nodes have a lot more uh, remote control and configuration virtualization in them, allow you to do a lot more cool things. Um, they're going to improve signal quality and also overall capacity. So you're going to start seeing a lot of new nodes put out in the field. And then um, migrating to virtual CCAT platforms for remote fight appointments and also... Um, to cap and grow traditional centralized CCAP platforms, but I really think a lot more virtualization is going to happen. It's going to be a lot less coax in the head ends, a lot more fiber, uh, a lot more Ethernet, um, and that's going to give you a lot more uh, ability to control and monitor things remotely, um, which should improve performance. It should be really cool stuff. And then also replacing a lot of these old amplifiers, taps, and other passives, and getting the network ready for DOCSIS 4.0, which is the next revolution that's going to take us to. 10 gig upstream, 10 gig downstream. That's what Cable Labs is calling 10G. Um, so that's kind of in the next five years. And again, you know, with with regard to mid splits, distributed access, uh, DOCSIS 4.0, all this stuff has been talked about for years now. Um, and it looks like we're finally getting close to widespread deployment, which is pretty exciting. I always find it interesting in cable how when Cable Labs SCTE and the vendors start hyping up the next big thing, um, showing the new products at Expo. Everyone thinks it's about to take the industry by storm. And then it inevitably does take over the industry, not so much by storm, and usually years later. But um, the spike nothing, in upstream... Nothing happens yeah. overnight. No, it doesn't. You know, the, the industry's like, yay, we're going to do all this. We're going to have 10G tomorrow. No. We're going to have DOCSIS 3.0 tomorrow. It took years for DOCSIS 3.0 to finally become widespread. And the same will happen with those other stuff. But I really think that the spike in upstream data demands from COVID and kind of the trends that will persist after that, even when COVID sort of uh, hopefully is eradicated soon, uh, I think it's going to accelerate the deployment of this stuff. Plus, you know, another thing you talk about, sounds like these wireless companies are coming for the home internet service. So yeah, you've got some competition from that uh, quarter. Mm, I think that's going to cause uh, cable TV to move, keep moving faster and get this stuff out there. They're, they're going to have to. We talked about Verizon uh, rolling out their home internet service uh, in, in more cities as we speak. T-Mobile, I believe, is reported uh, is going to start rolling out their 5G home internet service either later this year or maybe as early next year. I can't remember off the top of my head. But like you said, cellular companies are, are coming for the home internet um, game are getting in the home internet game. Uh, so, you know, cable companies will have to have to step up. But, you know, like you said, it, it took DOCSIS 3.0 years uh, to fully materialize. And the same thing for DOCSIS 4.0 and, and, and 10G. Uh, it will happen. Uh, just you know, nothing good happens overnight. So good things come yeah. to those who wait. I suppose so. And I mean, realistically, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the data usage of a home versus uh, what people use on their phone is still way higher. So even oh, though for sure. you can get uh, you know, fifty dollar um you know gigabit wireless connection from T Mobile or Verizon at your home and just add that to your cell phone bill, um, they they're saying their networks can handle the demand that is or the data that's being uh, pulled by households now. But it's such a huge spike from what people use on their phones now, it's hard for me to believe that they really can handle that if we just suddenly op offloaded all of the cable TV um, DOCSIS customers' data over to a wireless network. I feel no. like it would crash. And it's <laughs> same, I mean, the same concept goes for them. It's not going to happen overnight. And, and no. And thankfully for them, they're not going to have to see that transition where, uh, you know, 
in one day, everybody switches over to, to their service and um, they have to handle all of that um, data going upstream and downstream. So, but yeah, that's well, the battle Royale, battle another Royale. battle Thanks. Royale in the telecom industry. Thanks for all the, uh, the technical info there on, uh, on RF and the docs is 3.0, 3.1 and 4.0 in the future. Yes, sir. You know, Andy, I'm trying to think exactly how this quote went uh, from President Ronald Reagan. I th- he had a couple of funny quotes, but um, one was that the scariest words you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And it sounds <laughs> like the Internet, the government's going to help out with Internet. Uh, is it, am I reading this right? Man, they're trying. <laughs> they, they're absolutely trying. And, I, I you know, in, in the notes, I label it as government tinkering with the Internet because I don't want to call it. Um, you know, some, some other words are regulating or anything like that. Meddling. They're, they're, they're those meddling kids. No, they're, they're, they're tinkering with the internet here. So last week, House uh, Majority Whip James Cleburne, a Democrat from South Carolina, reintroduced a bill to close the digital divide by connecting everyone to the internet at one gigabit speeds. The bill is called the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act and has a government price tag of $100 billion. The bill is the product of the um, Rural Broadband Task Force, uh, which Representative Cleburne is the head of. And apparently he has already lined up support in both the House and the Senate uh, for this bill. So um, that bill is out there. And, you know, John and I aren't going to debate the, the pros and cons of this bill and, and Internet for all. And, you know, it's a potentially divisive topic uh, for, for really anybody, much like much like any political discourses today has the, the potential to be very divisive. So any, but anytime you introduce something else as a basic right, there's debate that follows. I will point out uh, this bill seems to aim to make internet affordable for all, not free for all. Uh, so we're not just, we're not just out here trying to trying to hand out internet access to everybody for free. Anywho. Or an internet out of helicopters all over the place. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anywho, this bill follows more uh, government tinkering with the internet as a bipartisan group of senators drafted a letter that called for the quadrupling, not the doubling, not the tripling, the quadrupling of base high-speed broadband delivery speeds making 100 megabits per second symmetrical, that means both upload and download speeds, the new base for high-speed broadband. As John and I have belabored time and time again in previous podcasts, The current definition of high-speed broadband has remained unchanged for six years uh, and is a meager, and I will will stress meager, 25 megabits per second down and three megabits per second up. So it is encouraging, um, at least to me, to see Congress folk interested in expanding that definition uh, as it is is well past due. Um, One example that they use to show the need to increase the baseline definition is the recommended upload speed for a zoom meeting uh, you know zoom has exploded in popularity since um the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic everybody uses zoom whether it's for work for school to see grandparents um celebrate birthdays you know um virtual uh, virtual trivia weddings uh, virtual trivia over zoom you know it's 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 there for uh um you know for all sorts of occasions whether it's zoom microsoft teams you know, Google Meet, all sorts of platforms out there. Uh, But so Zoom specifically recommends a minimum of 3.8 megabits per second for just one 1080p video. Uh, And the shift to remote schooling and virtual work meetings forces families to run multiple streams at the same time. So I'll say that again. They recommend 3.8 megabits per second of up, you know, just to run one video. Well, if the broadband definition is now, you know, three megabits per second up, someone could technically have high-speed broadband access and not be able to successfully have a good quality Zoom call, let alone, you know, three Zoom calls, you know, two parents working and Sally downstairs doing her, doing her Zoom class meeting. It's just, it's just not going to happen at three megabits per second up. Um, So clearly Congress also sees this as a, as a need to, to up the definition. Uh, you know, also mentioned as evidence of the need to increase the benchmark are telemedicine and agriculture, which John specifically for agriculture, agriculture 
you have spoken on in regards to USDA grants aimed at increasing connectivity in farming communities. Indeed. So, you know, if you have a chance to interact with your representatives in the near future, you want to write to them. If this topic speaks out to you, you know, now would be a good time to push them to raise, raise the base broadband speed benchmarks as, you know, they're already looking to do it. Um, you know, and they'll, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear uh, their constituents supporting that. It is certainly welcomed by this podcast. And, oh, you want more government money going into telecom? Well, I have it for you. On the same day that Representative Cleborne uh, introduced his bill, which, again, $100 billion American dollars. Um, so the same day he introduced his bill, 32 members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee introduced a $312 billion American dollars infrastructure bill uh, called the Lift American Act that covers energy, drinking water, health care, and you guessed it, broadband. Um, the broadband portion of the bill is to the tune of $109.3 billion. And of that $109.3 billion, the FCC would be allowed to award $60 billion of that, with the rest going directly to state governments. Uh, I wasn't able to find any specifics on um, you know, who would be able to, if they would do a, an auction, who would be able to bid on it? Are they looking at, um, you know, more 5G or looking more at the cable side? I don't, I didn't see any specifics on it. I can do some more digging, but I mean, just looking at that, you know, $60 billion um, up to that can be handed out by the FCC on top of RDOF, on top of the C-band auction, on top of CBRS auction, on top of the Connect America Fund too. Um, you know, we just continue to see uh, the funnel of government funds into the industry and allow the expansion of next generation networks. Um, hey, it's good to see. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cry about it. No, I mean, but just think about the scale of this. I mean, we're talking, let's just, okay. Between the two bills, uh, let's just say, I don't know if they're, they're not both going to get passed separately. I sure, would probably not. So let's just say a hundred, hundred billion. We're talking $100 billion or $109.3 billion. Can compare that to RDOF, which is, 16.4 billion i mean art off is peanuts compared to this yeah. dollar amount and you look at what is happening as a result of our offer a company that wins you know a big chunk of it like uh, like charter is building a whole new division and they're hiring let's see 40 people per vp so like that's gonna at least create uh maybe close to 300 new jobs yeah. within charter not to mention all the contractors are gonna hire um this is on a much grander scale. I mean, and we've already talked about how are we going to build all the broadband for um, for the with the Ardoff money, and not that there's not enough crews, not enough equipment, not enough materials to build all that. What is this going to do? Well, hopefully, the end result is that it's going to massively boost the American economy. But that, that dollars like that getting thrown around for stuff, I mean that's going to have a massive impact. One thing I could see, so a lot of RDOF and the, the CAF2 funds are going towards the construction side, the new construction side. If mm -hmm. um, the government you know, mandates that the uh, broadband benchmark needs to be raised, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of upgrades. So a lot of this money could be going on the maintenance side for upgrades of existing networks versus you know, RDOF and the construction of new networks. Um, so, I mean, it, it could... Um, it could benefit the, you know, the maintenance side and just upgrading already existing networks uh, and pour money into that. And like you said, it's just, it, um, and it, you did a story yeah. on it. Just the, the manpower shortage is, you know, where, where, where are we going to find the people to do all of this? But, um, but hey, well, I mean, not trying. Yeah. But I mean, that's the, that's an astute observation too, about how um, we can also look, look at some of this maybe going to upgrades um that's going to create some more technical jobs and um you know for uh i mean part of that is what we were talking about earlier with cable companies mm -hmm. investing in uh upstream upgrades distributed access uh, doxis 4.0 you know that's going to be a piece of that because there's still cable networks out there that are delivering you know not many left but there's still some out there that are only delivering 25 megs at best so yeah, yeah it's going to be upgrading uh, fixed wireless networks. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of new equipment to go with all this. And we'll be upgrading for life. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, folks, thanks for sticking around this long. Thanks for, again, listening to Andy and John Talk Telecom. Please subscribe to us on um, Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Amazon Audible. Uh, 
wherever you listen to your podcast. If you'd like to watch the podcast instead, go on over to YouTube and search Andy and John Talk Telecom and follow us on there. Leave some feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so we're going to do a quick this month in telecom history. We're going to do uh, an announcement for a couple of SCTE trainings that are upcoming next week. And John's got a quick travel corner and we will get you out of here. So uh, this month in telecom history, uh, March 10th, 1876, what happened on that date? The first telephone call in uh, world, the world, the history of the world. Uh, what were the first words ever spoken on the telephone? They were, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. And who were they spoken by? N uh, none other than Alexander Graham Bell, the father and inventor of the telephone. Uh, made that first call, like I said, March 10th, 1876. And it's crazy to see how far we've come from one telephone to being able to call people across the world, being able to call space um, and, and all sorts of um, technological upgrades we have been able to do since then. But it all started with one simple phone call spoken by Mr. Alexander Graham Bell. Fascinating. And that uh, also probably prompted a steady, long decline in knowledge of Morse code. Yes, because... yeah, because I, I mean I couldn't even tap out SOS right now. Morse code. <laughs> I knew more of it back when I was in the army, but now it's just, it's it's a uh, it's a, a lost um, lost talent for me. But it is what it is. All right, let's move on to uh, upcoming SCTE trainings, and we have two for you that we think you might be interested in. If you're interested or if you want to see others, go to SCTE.org. We would highly encourage that you become a member of that fine organization, but you can go to events, go to their calendar and see all of their training, training events. But the two that we are going to point out to you, the first one is on Wednesday, March 24th, 2021, starting at 8.30 a.m. Central Time, going to 9.30. It is the Sooner State, uh, the Sooner Chapter up in Oklahoma, and they are doing a training on installing, maintaining, and troubleshooting the home and business wireless network. Uh, the second uh, occurs the next day on Thursday, March 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the West Virginia Mountaineer Chapter invites you to join them for OTDR Fundamentals, Advanced op Optical Testing, uh, Latest PLN Innovations, Tips, and Techniques. As always, like I said, go to SCT.org. Um, that's SCTE.org. Uh, and you can view all of the trainings coming up uh, on their calendar there. And John, you said uh, that you had a, a travel corner. You had a, a recommendation for a, a restaurant for us. Where's where's this at? Yeah, whenever I go to El Paso, Texas, um, I Paso. seek out one restaurant. Um, it was actually introduced to this place by uh, one of my customers. He was a construction um supervisor at old time warner cable back in the day i was visiting him a friend of mine and he like he got transferred to el paso and i went to visit him and he's like oh i gotta take you to this place and it is the l and j cafe i thought it was delicious and i've been trying to go there every time i go through el paso ever since what um, kind of food what kind of fare do they offer there well the l and j cafe offers uh hamburgers um i think there's a hamburger on the menu everything else is mexican food though and that's what I would recommend. Um, they give you some amazing red salsa and these homemade tortilla chips that are really thick and crunchy. Um, definitely not some kind of just regular old tortilla chips that came out of a bag. They're made made fresh and, and they're so good. So, I mean, you could just get a beer and eat chips and salsa for a while and be good. But all the rest of the stuff is great. Um, enchiladas, uh, tacos, burritos. And this place is kind of uh, kind of divey, I guess. Mm -hmm. It was a building as housed a restaurant since the 1920s, I believe. I think it was started as Tony's Place or something back in the 20s. And then um, I think the uh, kids or some something, some family members took it over in the 60s and called it L and J Cafe. And I guess it's been there ever since. It's called the Little Place by the Graveyard because it's across the street from Graveyard. But um, last time I was in El Paso, uh, recently I went there for lunch both days i was in town and um parking is always challenged there so um that should be a good indicator that it's probably a hot spot and it's a place that uh apparently you'll see local 
lawyers, celebrities, well, maybe the guy that Big does the news, Paso, does the though. does the news on TV on the local TV <laughs> station. But I mean, anyway, local movers and shakers eat there, um, and then your regulars sitting there day drinking on a on a Monday. So, yeah, it's a good spot. Highly recommended uh, to get into L and J Cafe if you're in El Paso and want to have some fantastic Mexican food. Well, I will absolutely check that out because uh, we know South Texas has some fantastic. Uh, Mexican and Tex-Mex food. So if you are recommending this, then I will, I will certainly want to try it. So, Definitely. well, that, that about does it for, uh, for our episode, episode 19 today, John, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, however short it may be. And, um, I'll see you next time. All right. Until right, next now, time. Now logging off Andy and John talk telecom.